Thank you so much. I want to thank Marta um, and also Jana and also Julia Seglener and also Masaryk University for inviting me to share my work on the exhibition of animals in the late 19th century. Um, Marta and I, as she mentioned, share an interest in universal expositions. And we really enjoyed having her visit the University of Alberta a few years back to talk about her work on World's Fairs. So I'm really looking forward to talking with you today about my new project, which is about exhibiting horses. And particularly today, I'm going to talk about exhibiting horses at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. So I will start with a little bit of self-promotion. Um, I want to begin with um, actually John Berger's famous question from 1980, why look at animals? Uh, because my interest in the exhibition of animals comes out of the research that I did for this book, which I published two years ago. And the Spanish element in our nationality looks at the traditional English only narrative of US history and uses Spanish participation in a series of international world's fairs to illuminate the close and very contested relationship between those two countries. Traditional histories of the United States invariably remind us that the Spanish financed Christopher Columbus's historic voyage across the Atlantic Ocean in 1492. But very few people think about the subsequent contributions of Spain on the development of US national identity. And so in this book, what I tried to do was investigate the reasons for what I see as a very problematic memory gap. Um, and what I did is I chronicled a series of Spanish displays at International World's Fairs and argued that by studying the exhibition of Spanish paintings, the construction, the construction of ephemeral architectural space, and also other manifestations of visual culture, I wanted to look at how Spain repeatedly sought to position itself as a contributor to US national history and how the United States, in comparison to other American nations, such as Mexico, Chile, Argentina, subverted and ignored those messages. These, the, these moves on the part of the, of the World's Fair organizers made it possible to marginalize and ultimately obscure Spanish identity in the United States. So as I was looking at these fairs, I began to notice the animals. They, appear, they appeared repeatedly in the primary literature and they were exhibited in a lot of different ways on the fairgrounds, but the scholars didn't seem to be writing about them. So I decided to take a closer look. And by focusing on just this one exhibition, the exhibition of animals at the 1893 Columbian Exposition, I wanna make the, the relevance of animals to art history, to the history of exhibitions, and also to our world in general, a bit more visible. So by way of orientation, I'll start with this map of the Chicago World's Fair um, and point out just a few of the places where you could have seen animals. So the buildings devoted to agriculture, and that's where the blue dot has just appeared, and fisheries are obvious places to begin. But ex exhibitions related to animals were also found in transportation and remember that this was the period before the arrival of the horseless carriage. There were no automobiles. So they were well uh, represented in transportation. They were also in manufactures and liberal arts. They were in fine arts and in the many state and national pavilions, which are immediately above fine arts. And the Midway, which is over here, also housed several displays of live animals as did two off-site venues. One was Buffalo Bill's Wild West Arena, which was just outside the fairgrounds. And the other was in Washington Park, um, which was way at, at, at the very end of the Midway. So to start, we'll look at some of the animals in the art galleries. There were paintings of cows, sheep, chickens, and of course, horses. So these are four works from the US section, the US painting section, clockwise from, left, from the top left, you have William Howe's Norman Bull, uh, John Enneking's Salting Sheep, Henry Poor's The Bridge, and another work by Enneking titled A South Massachusetts Clam Digger. So domestic rather than wild animals were commonly seen in the art show. The Horseman, which was a journal 
subtitled, An Illustrated Journal Devoted to the Interests of the Horse, His Owner, and His Friends, pointed to this painting by English painter George Clausen in its brief discussion of animal painting at the fair. Quote, the fine arts building is a pleasant place for the horse lover to tarry, for on every hand are studies by master brushes of equine life. Clausen's plowing is a fine study in farm horse life. The majority of the horses that look at you from the World's Fair canvases are, however, representations of the coarser breeds. The European artists and sculptors seem to prefer the cart horse as subjects. Indeed, the art exhibits, as far as horses go, is exactly in keeping with the livestock shows. So one of the things that I'm doing in this new project is I'm looking not at the fine arts literature, but I'm looking at the agricultural literature. I'm looking at journals like The Horseman, which only occasionally discussed art in the formal sense of the term. And The Horseman's, the journal's reference to the coarser breeds brings up one of the biggest objections that horse lovers had about the Columbian Exposition. It was heavy draft animals rather than lightweight racehorses that were exhibited at the fair. The animal sculptures placed outside the agriculture building also depicted the coarser breeds. Alexander Proctor's monumental rendering of labor, which was also called industry, uh, and it's on your left. It depicts a strapping young farm boy in his massive draft horse, harnessed and ready for the plow. It was paired with Plenty on your right. It depicted Ceres, the mythological goddess of, of agriculture, next to an equally massive bull. Chicago's location in the Midwest, home to the nation's biggest meatpacking stockyards and the agricultural heartland of the nation, made the exhibition of fruit, grain, vegetables, and livestock especially important at the fair. And inside the agricultural building was ample evidence of the country's fertility. Fair organizers tied animals, both domestic animals and wild animals, to nationhood. And for this reason, Proctor and the other sculptors who worked at the fair chose species native to North America to ornament the bridges, the pathways, etc., of the fairgrounds. So this photograph from one of the many souvenir books that was produced for visitors to the fair was accompanied with the following caption, quote, with, due, with a due regard for the general fitness of things, the decorations about the grounds, grounds are, where possible, purely American, and every effort has been made to introduce some features characteristic of this country. So the two animals in this photograph are an elk on your left and a moose, both of which are indigenous to North America. And actual animals preserved through the art of taxidermy were found in many parts of the fair as well. The state of Kansas sponsored one of the most impressive taxidermy displays ever created to date by 1893, and it was called the Panorama of North American Mammals. From left to right in this photograph, you can see a number of wild animals that are also indigenous to North America. There are moose, mountain goats, mule deer, bighorn sheep, elk, and bison. There are also taxidermied heads in the foreground. Designed by Lewis Lindsay Dyke, the Kansas Panorama was actually the first to exhibit taxidermied animals installed in naturalistic habitats. And it was an installation technique that was that natural history museums quickly adapt, adopted, adapted and adopted. There were live animals on the midway, the entertainment zone that stretched from the fair, fairgrounds to the shores of, from the shore of Lake Michigan to Washington Park. The Hagenbeck family sponsored a wild animal show. The Lapland village included Arctic reindeer, several of which unfortunately perished during the hot Chicago summer and an ostrich farm presented fairgoers to these large flightless birds from Africa. There were also several gigantic aquariums with live fish in the fisheries building. And two of the most colorful exhibitions of horses at the fair were Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, which was staged in the large arena just outside the fairgrounds, and the less commercially successful Wild East Show, which was on the midway. 
The Wild East Show featured a, be a beautiful group of Arabian horses sent with Bedouin riders from the Ottoman Empire. A relatively small horse with a dished profile, protruding eyes, wide nostrils, and a short back, these highly coveted purebreds were still only rarely found in the United States. You could count the number in the United States on two hands. And this inspired one of the most disgraceful events in the history of the fair. Although the Turkish Sultan agreed to send some of his empire's finest Arabians to Chicago with the stipulation that they would return to the Middle East, duplicitous promoters and loan sharks ensured the opposite. These impressive animals were claimed as collateral, seized and sold in auction in January, 1894. In fact, the US Arabian stud book begins with two horses, a stallion named Oberon and a mare named Nejdeme, Nejde who performed on the Midway at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Exhibitions related to animal equipment, <coughs> carriages, saddles, even horseshoes, were found in both the transportation and the manufacturer's buildings. But the live animals were exhibited behind the agriculture building in the livestock department. Hubert Howe Bancroft, who was the author of a very amply illustrated book called Book of the Fair, devoted an entire chapter to this part of the, uh, of the exhibition. Farm animals were housed in a number of plainly constructed barns where the horses, cattle, sheep, swine, and poultry were brought in on a rotating schedule during the course of the summer. No vicious or fractious animals were allowed, and all the animals from foreign countries were subject to quarantine regulations. The arena in which they were exhibited, which is seen in the image above, was a pavilion of about 380 by 250 feet. It was sited between the barns and the agricultural building. Surrounded by 10 tiers of seats, it accommodated up to 10,000 spectators. So given the complex logistics involved in bringing live animals to the fair. Most of the horses in Chicago's livestock exhibit came from the United States, although breeders in Canada sent a respectable number as well. There were also a few coach horses sent from Germany, and Grand Duke Dmitri Konstantin sent, uh, sent a small but choice group of horses from Russia. But draft horses far outnumbered the lighter breeds, and foreign bred horses were vastly outnumbered by native born specimens. The Percherons in Chicago, and the Percherons are a draft bead, a breed originally developed in France, were all bred in North America, as were the Shires and the Clydesdales, originally from England and Scotland. These large horses were brought into the exhibition pavilion according to breed and age and lined up for the judge's approval. The evaluation process was solemn, with the judges quietly looking at one animal after another, much as you see in this image. The process was actually quite similar to the one that was used in fine arts, where each submission was carefully examined. Draft horses in the agricultural pavilion were judged, in other words, almost as if they were individual paintings. They were standing still, almost as if they were hanging on the wall. The final report lists the prize-winning animals by breed, name, sex, age, and owner. Stallions and mares were valued particularly high for their breeding potential, and both were occasionally exhibited along with their offspring. Geldings were shown less frequently, usually in harness, and a gelding is a, a castrated male horse. Prize-winning animals were awarded a small premium, First place winners received $200, and some were given full page portraits, 13 of which appear in the horse section of the report. This image depicts a horse named Oso. He was a four-year-old stallion exhibited by DJ Cameron from Minnesota. And Oso was one of the very few racing horses that was exhibited at the fair. So I wanna talk a little bit about horse portraits. They usually fo follow the format that you see here. The horse is shown in profile, parallel to the picture plane, with his weight firmly planted on all four legs, which are also all clearly visible to show the presence of any distinguishing socks. Horse-savvy viewers, according to one 19th century expert, believed that, quote, the weak points of a horse 
can be better discovered while standing than while moving. If he is sound, he will stand firmly and squarely on his limbs without moving them. The head is turned outward ever so slightly to reveal any facial markings. And the ears are always rotated forward at attention. Oso has no facial markings. He has no star, stripe, blaze, or even a snip on his nose. And Louise Lippincott and Andreas Blum, who've written about horse portraiture, note that the profile view fundamental to scientific illustration reveals the greatest number of important characteristics simultaneously. As with neoclassical painting, clear outline, pure color, firm modeling, order, regularity, and precision were valued. And the backgrounds of these images are almost entirely imaginary. So the profile pose, it had been developed in the 18th century, and you'll find it in encyclopedia texts by authors such as the Comte de Buffon, who began publishing his natural history in 1749. And it's interesting and important to point out that these representations are not necessarily so lifelike, for many of Buffon's images were made from skin, bones, or other drawings rather than actual observation of living creatures. The animals don't move. Shortly after Johann Caspar Lavater, who drew on Charles Lebrun's work on human facial expressions and emotions, included a section on animals in his, paint, in his book on physiognomy. Not only did Lavater show that the character of a horse could be determined by the shape of its nose, the flare of its nostrils, and the set of its eyes, explained Lippincott and Bloom, but he also implied that the origin of these expressions was to be found in the animal's soul. After Lavater, one looked at an animal not only to assess its strength, durability, and nutritional value, but also for character, rapport, and communication. So, oh so, to return to him, he holds his head up high, his eye is bright, and his ears are perked forward, effectively conveying his noble spirit and his readiness for the race. McQueen, another, a second prize sedalion, and he also appeared in the final report. So both of these image, images now come from the final report. He was exhibited by R. Ogilvy of Madison, Wisconsin. Powerful Clydesdale, McQueen's orientation to the picture plane has been shifted slightly in order to make the strength of his hindquarters more evident. Yet all four feet remain firmly planted and clearly visible. McQueen sports white socks on his two back legs and his head is turned just enough to reveal a white blaze that runs down his forehead to the, to the bridge of his nose. Unlike Oh So, McQueen's tail has been tied into a knot. I should say a horse's tail provides it with protection with it from insects, which it can very quickly dislodge with a quick flick. The knot, however, accomplishes several things. It prevents the tail from becoming dirty or entangled in the equipment to which the horse may be harnessed. And in terms of aesthetics, it makes those powerful hind muscles all the more visible. In these horse portraits, the horse needed to be readily recognizable, both in terms of breed, you've got a racehorse on your left, you have a, a draft horse on the right, but also as individuals. And the production of horse portraits was lucrative business. This is a report again from the horseman. Located in downtown Chicago, there was a brand new horse photograph gallery that was housed in a splendid brick, iron, and glass building consisting of three stories and a basement. And I'll read you just a little bit of the text. I'm gonna excise a few things for brevity. The principal feature of this photographic plant is the immense skylight 42 feet wide by 38 feet high and 130 feet long. The building is devoted to photographing horses and carriages. The skylight is reached by a paved driveway. Appropriate backgrounds, as large as a theatrical drop scene, are used for this special branch of photography. A little bit later in the article it says, Chicago has long needed such a place as this, and it is with pleasure that we recommend this gallery to our readers. The business is now in full operation and it embraces not only photography <coughs> in all its branches, portrait, commercial, and equinal, but engravings of horses, cattle, and other animals, 
are made directly from these photographs for use in catalogs and otherwise. So a facility such as this one, perhaps it was this one, was used to create the portraits that are found in the final report. They were then reproduced in journals, these images were then reproduced in journals, and they were collected as well by horse aficionados who purchased them to hang in their homes or offices. Whether preparing a horse to have its portrait taken in a photograph studio or for exhibition in the fair's agricultural pavilion, the project of bringing a horse into the desired pose entailed the work of many individuals, among them a groom and a handler. The groom bathed, clipped, combed, and brushed to a high sheen the horse's mane, tail, and coat. The groom also polished the horse's hooves and otherwise ensured an impeccable turnout. The handler accompanied the horse into the photo studio or into the arena. When entering the show arena, draft horses were brought in at a trot before bringing them to a square halt for exhibition. Notice that the top horse, according to the caption is ready for inspection. In contrast, the photograph at the bottom makes some of the challenges of exhibiting horses and in animals more generally evident. For in this case, the camera has snapped before the Clydesdale in the foreground has agreed to lower its head and front hoof. Such Im images of animal resistance are not usually made public, rodeo photographs being an exception to this rule. Horses trained to pull co coaches, carriages, and other types of vehicles were exhibited in harness, and these animals were depicted in motion. Here also from the final report are two German coach horses, driven by a woman accompanied by a young child. That a woman and child are in the carriage attests to the high level of training such animals display. But as portraits, the image is somewhat disappointing. The two horses, Molka and Kaiser Frederick are trotting in tandem and the head of the far horse is almost entirely hidden by his counterpart. Their elegant trotting gait is perfectly rendered, however, with both horses moving their front right hooves forward at the same time as their back left. The trot has a two beat rhythm with front and back legs working on a diagonal. It's a fairly bumpy gait to ride under saddle but it's very smooth for the pulling of a vehicle. Horses can also trot for hours, whereas they can canter for only short distances before needing to rest. These horses, they're also called hackneys, are trained to move forward either at a walk or a trot, never breaking into a canter or a gallop. Whereas hackneys often working in pair, often, whereas hackneys often working in pairs or teams trot gracefully and at a moderate rate, racing trotters such as Oso oh move at very high speeds. A racing trotter can reach speeds that far, far exceed the gallop of the average horse. So there was a fairly good selection of hackneys, but very few trotters at the Chicago World's Fair. And Wallace's Monthly, which is another horse journal, this one published by the American Trotting Register Association, provides one of the reasons why. Quote, as we have remarked elsewhere, the public in going to a horse show expect to see the animals act. Trotters cannot show what they can do in a small arena. Hence, they are unable to provide excitement or attraction. How different they are from their cousins, the, show, the, the slow but showy hackney. The hackney of all breeds is the one that can provide more attractive action <coughs> in a circumscribed space than any other. The hackney can show off on a small lot. The trotter needs a whole quarter section. So the type of movement for which these two types of horses were known required very different types of exhibition spaces. The place to see trotters, continued the journal, was at the racetrack. And I continue with the quote from the same article. When the public wants to see the trotters, it does not go to the horse show, but to the trotting tracks. These alone can provide what the public wants of the exhibition of the trotter in action. The editors for The Horseman, the other journal, made a very similar observation, expressing dis disappointment in the exhibition options available at the official World's Fair. 
although, quote, the great trotting meeting to be held almost under the shadow of the massive domes and shapely minarets of the White City will be a magnificent exhibition of the harness horse as a racehorse, they wrote. It is fitting and desirable as well that within the walls of the fair, when all the other types of American stock are shown to our own and to foreign people, that the trotting breed should be adequately, adequately represented. End of the quote. But despite, despite such pleas and despite a change of date by the fair organizers in order to avoid overlapping with the races, very few trotters were actually shown in the agricultural pavilion. Trotters were instead exhibited, in other words, raced at Washington Park, a short walk west, where from September 5th to September 15th, the Northwestern Breeders Association sponsored its fall meeting, its fall races. Both show pavilion and racetrack function as metaphorical galleries for horses on display. But whereas the draft horses stood still in the show ring and the hackneys pranced at a moderate speed around a comparatively small arena, these horses on the track traveled at maximum speed. Speed, time, and distance were the order of the day. Now the Washington Park racetrack had opened just nine years before the World's Fair and it had quickly become one of the country's preeminent venues. It was used for both flat racing, with jockeys riding on the horse, and for harness racing. Thoroughbreds are used for flat racing, with jockeys riding on the horse. I'm sorry, it was, it, it was used for flat racing and for harness racing. Thoroughbreds are used for flat racing, whereas standard breads are used for harness. Flat racers gallop and harness racers trot and trotters are attached to a lightweight vehicle known as a sulky, in which the driver sits and drives the horse from behind. So you can see the sulkies attached to several horses preparing to race in the bottom right foreground of this image. And that above is a series of race winning times from two minutes, seven and three quarter seconds to two minutes, four seconds. These are for a mile. A large circular oval, the track at Washington Park had a very large grandstand that provided seating for up to some 25,000 viewers. And the standard bread. The standard bread, which was used for harness racing, is a breed that had been developed in the United States. Whereas Percherons, Clydesdales, and even thoroughbreds are, are breeds that had <sighs> originally de developed in Europe. Breeds such as the thoroughbred can only be registered in the stud books if both its mother and its father the dam and the sire, are already inscribed in those stud books. However, the only requirement for inclusion in the standard bred reg registry, which was established in 1879, was that the horse be able to trot a mile in less than two minutes, 30 seconds. As a result, some considered the standard bred a more democratic breed than the others. The standard bred had been developed by combining breeds, among them the Hackney, the Thoroughbred, the Narragansett Pacer, the Norfolk Trotter, and the Morgan. These are all different breeds of horses. It was derived, like many citizens of the United States, from a mixture made possible by, move, by the movement of living things across the Atlantic Ocean, from Europe to America. According to the description of this image, this is from the horseman, it was especially incumbent upon um, the breeders of trotters to make a grand exhibit at the World's Fair. Quote, for the trotting breed is the peculiarly American breed, the one valuable type of horse indigenous to the soil of America. But only one man, um, the owner of Roy Wilkes, who is the stallion in this picture on the top right, responded to the plea. Exhibited or concours, Roy Wilkes was described as, quote, one of the most noted stallions uh, on exhibition. He has a fine head, a perfect muzzle, bright, intelligent eyes, a pair of well-shaped ears of medium length, and is of the most kindly disposition." End of the quote. You might also note that he, along with the four other horses featured on the cover of this journal, is a pacing stallion. And this is a term that's worthy of a little bit more explication. For harness racers come in two types, pacers and trotters. Both gates are intermediate speeds in between the walk and the gallop. 
but the legs move differently. A pacer, as you see on the left, moves, moves his legs laterally. In other words, the right front and right hind leg move forward at one time. As those right legs then begin moving back, thereby propelling the horse forward, the left front and left back take their place. It's a gait that some horses will take more naturally than others, and breeders have also learned that pacers will often breed pacing foals. But trotters can breed pacers as well. They're both standard breads. Trotters, as we saw earlier, move their legs on a diagonal. In this image, the trotter, who's on your right, um, has its right front and back, leg, back legs forward. Pacers are actually faster than trotters, which is interesting because trotters were valued more highly. The highest stakes competition in 1893 was the Colombian Exposition Free For All, which offered the first place winning horse and its owner a purse worth the astronomical sum of $15,000. Remember that the winner at the World's Fair got $200. So this particular race was open to trotters of any age, but not to pacers. The largest purse available to the pacers at Washington Park was worth only one third this amount. It was called the World's Fair Stake, and it had a purse of $5,000. $5, so I found no official explanation for the relative popularity of trotters compared to pacers. One would think that pacers would be more popular because they can go faster. But one racing professional provided an interesting response to my question. Whereas the pacer rocks slightly from left to right when it moves, the trotter, because its legs are moving on a diagonal, looks more balanced. The answer may therefore have to do with the visual appearance of the horse when it is in motion. And so in this slide, you've got the pacer flying jib on your left, who won the world's fair stake, and the trotters, Pixley and Alex, who are battling it out in the Colombian free-for-all on the right. So look closely at their legs and at the horses. See what you think. So the Colombian free-for-all, which was raced in nine heats over the course of three days, turned out to be actually one of the most exciting races of the 19th century. It was, according to the horsemen, quote, a race of startling events and troublous vicissitudes, of brilliant trotting and astute track generalship of alleged conspiracy and foul tactics, of official weakness and vacillation, just when firm and even dra drastic methods were urgently called for, and finally of triumph in the end for what the public <laughs> deemed right. So what is this race? It began with 10 horses and the betting was lively. A mare named Hulda was the favorite with the gambling crowd. But Hulda broke in the first heat, which means that she broke from a trot into a gallop, leaving two underdogs, Alex and Pixley, to battle it out for first. <coughs> the caption to the front page of the horseman, which is depicting the end of the first heat, reads, Pixley came with such a rush at the finish that her nose was at Alex's throat latch when they crossed the line in two minutes, seven and three quarters seconds the fastest heat ever trotted in a race. By the end of the fourth heat, two horses had withdrawn with injuries, including the favorite, Holda, leaving only eight to compete on the second day. The second day began, but just before the fifth heat, Alex's driver reported to her owner that he had been offered $2,500 to drop the race. Rumors were also heard that several drivers were planning to foul Alex on the first turn, and this is exactly what happened. Just as Alex was making her, away, her way around the first curve of the track, Pixley's driver swerved, crashing into her and forcing her into the rail. A foul was called, but rather than disqualifying Pixley completely, the judges sent her to the back of the pack. Alex, who had miraculously recovered from the mishap, mishap mishap, excuse me, um, uh, ended up sixth. Pixley crossed the line first in the next heat with Alex finishing second. And by the end of day two, with eight heats completed, the $15,000 prize was still up in the air. 
Now the ninth and final heat on day three began with only six horses still in the race. All of them were exhausted by this time and the book, bookies, the gambling bookies, now considered Pixley the favorite. But Alex, according to the horseman, quote, trotted Pixley to a break halfway up the stretch and coming on alone one jogging amidst the most tumultuous cheering of the meeting. The public heart is always with the underdog and the people had come to believe that Alex was fighting unfair and desperate odds. Hence, they cheered wildly and frantically. They shook hands, they ill-used hats and canes and otherwise manifested exceeding great joy when Alex finally conquered. Wallace's monthly concurred and featured a portrait of Alex, suitable for framing in its very next issue. Here she is. That Alex had to beat unfair and desperate odds in the eyes of some was the inevitable result of gambling, which horse races in inspired. And the question of gambling was a hot topic in 1893. It was covered extensively by the press. Reform-minded citizens, including the mayor of Chicago, Hempstead Washburn, were working hard to close all the racetracks in, in the city. And his anti-gambling anti lobby did lead to a temporary closure of Washington Park the following year. The editors of The Horseman, not surprisingly, opposed such action, arguing instead for better gambling regulation. The persons who oppose betting on horse races are generally of that class with whom it is vain to reason, they complained. Racing and betting, they continued, go hand in hand. Racing is not sustainable without betting, and systems need to be in place to ensure that both the races and the betting are handled on honestly. A second controversial, controversial issue raised in relation to this particular mode of exhibiting horses relates to new technologies, especially those that were making possible faster and faster race times. The Sulky, a very lightweight carriage designed to carry a single driver, had during most of the 19th century sported two large wooden wheels held together with a metal rim like a barrel. And you can see these high wheeled sulkies on the bottom left and the top right. But one enterprising individual decided to substitute rubber tires for wood. He simply transferred bicycle tires, which were just becoming popular, um, to a sulky. The first rubber wheels were solid, but inflatable pneumatic tires were introduced soon after. And this shift in material was accompanied by a decrease in wheel size. So this, these are the sulky wheels that you can see at the top left and the bottom right. When the famous sulky driver, Bud Doble, he was also the owner of Pixley, was sent a sulky with ball bearings and pneumatic tires in July, 1892, just one year before the fair, he casually passed it off to his competitor, Ed Gear. Quote, greeted at first by jeers from the race goers, things began to change quite a bit when everyone began to notice that Gear and his drivers were achieving faster records on the track by two to four seconds. Alex in the Colombian free-for-all was pulling a sulky with the new pneumatic rubber tires. So as noted earlier, proponents of horn harness racing were disappointed at the failure of owners to send their horses to the World's Fair, except for Roy Wilkes, who was shown or concours, and a few others such as Oso, there were very few racehorses at all on view. Exhibition practices were partly to blame. Although both the racetrack and the agricultural pavilion generally function well as galleries for the horse, the organizers of the fair, and indeed the organizers of most agricultural fairs, conceive of their events as competitions in which each individual specimen or aggregation of specimens, whether animals, manufactured goods, mechanical inventions, or even works of art, are considered by judges either individually at, and at rest, or in the case of hackneys at a relatively slow speed. There's little room for the unexpected, the upset, or for an exhibition that is all about motion. Which is more exciting to watch, two trotters battling it out on the racetrack, or six draft horses lined up for inspection? And how to exhibit the animal in motion was a question that likewise was engaging photographers in the late 19th century. 
after viewing the Clydesdales in agriculture, cheering racehorses in nearby Washington Park, and watching a performance of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, visitors at the Chicago Fair could return to the Midway. First to see the Arabians with their Bedouin riders, and then to pay 25 cents to enter a small pavilion called the Zoopraxographical Hall. Inside was an exhibition mounted by photographer Edward Moybridge, who since the early 1870s had been engaged in experiments on animal motion. Leland Stanford, renowned California breeder of both thoroughbred flat racers and standard bred trotters, had hired Moybridge in 1872 to settle a question that could not be settled by the naked eye. Were all four feet of a trotter ever off the ground at the same time during an extended trot? Moybridge settled this question in the affirmative and then went on to perform other photographic experiments that showed the actual leg positions of a galloping horse. Artists who for centuries had depicted the horse running with all four feet extended, forward and backward, were forced to rethink this convention. Moybridge's earliest images were still photographs that show in split second intervals the successive movements of the horse. However, soon he began inventing devices that would place these still photographs in motion over time. One of the most popular of these inventions was the zoopraxiscope, which he displayed in his zoopraxographical hall at the Chicago Fair. By placing still images onto a circular disc, such as you see on the right, and by spinning the disc in a machine, Moybridge was able to create the illusion of movement. It was an early movie theater. Let's see if this is going to work. Oh, good. So this is what you might see through a zoopraxiscope. And Moybridge accompanied his exhibition of animal motion with lectures on his photographic practice. And he also had merchandise for sale. I want to conclude with this. Uh, I want to conclude this presentation by modifying John Berger's famous question from 1980. He had asked, why look at animals? So my question is, why should we look at the exhibition of animals? And even more specifically, why should we look at the exhibition of animals at the Universal Expositions? So every Christmas, The Horseman published a special holiday issue of the journal that included a full color lithograph suitable for framing. The image that they published in December 1893 after the closure of the Chicago World's Fair depicts an imaginary group of wealthy men in a comfortable clubhouse the walls of which are exhibited uh, on the walls of which are exhibited the kings and queens of the trotting and running turf. The image is full of warmth, light, and good cheer. A fire rage, rages in the hearth. A dog warms himself by the fire. The grandfather clock in the corner will soon strike the hour of midnight. And outside the window, a full moon rises behind a picturesque church covered by snow. In the foreground, gentlemen in evening dress are examining the likenesses, the portraits of famous racehorses. Domino, Yotambien, and Morello are on the right. All of these are thoroughbred flat racers. On the left are the trotters. You have Pansy McGregor, Nellie A, Fantasy, Directum, and Nancy Hanks. Alex, the underdog winner of the Colombian free-for-all, has just been hung in a place of honor on the wall. The man who has placed her there steps back to admire her portrait. So understanding this lithograph offers art historians opportunities for historical research into the development of national breeds, harness racing, rubber bicycle wheels, new technology, charges of unethical behavior on the part of drivers, owning owners, and the betting public, artistic conventions for depicting animals at rest and in motion, and the culture of display that would lead the men in this image to flip through a collection of horse portraits and select their favorites for hanging on the walls of their clubhouse. Studying the exhibition of animals at the World's Fairs, in other words, allows us to think in new ways about nationalism and national identity, innovation and technology, gambling and social reform, and the aesthetics of art. Thank you.